Hello everyone, this is Saurav from Edureka and today I'll be covering all the fundamentals of neural networks. After that, we'll be using that knowledge in order to solve a real life problem. So let's take a look at what we are going to implement in this session and after that we'll be discussing the agenda. So this is the problem statement guys, we need to figure out if the banknotes are real or fake. And for that we'll be using artificial neural networks. And obviously we need some sort of data in order to train our network. So let us see how the data set looks like. So over here I've taken a screenshot of the data set with few of the rows. In it data were extracted from images that were taken from genuine and forged banknote like specimens. After that wavelet transform tools were used to extract features from those images. And these are few features that I'm highlighting with my cursor. And the final column or the last column actually represents the label. So basically label tells us to which class that pattern represents. Whether that pattern represents a fake note or it represents a real note. Let us discuss these features and labels one by one. So the first feature or the first column is nothing but variance of a wavelet transformed image. The second column is about skewness. The third is courtesies of wavelet transformed image. And finally fourth one is entropy of the image. After that when I talk about label which is nothing but my last column. Over here if the value is 1 that means the pattern represents a real node. Whereas when value is 0 that means it represents a fake node. So guys let's move forward and we'll see what are the various steps involved in order to implement this use case. So over here we'll first begin by reading the data set that we have. We'll define features and labels. After that we are going to encode the dependent variable. And what is a dependent variable? It is nothing but your label. Then we are going to divide the data set into two parts. One for training, another for testing. After that we'll use TensorFlow data structures for holding features, labels, etc. And TensorFlow is nothing but a Python library that is used in order to implement deep learning models or you can say neural networks. Then we'll write the code in order to implement the model. And once this is done, we will train our model on the training data. We'll calculate the error. The error is nothing but your difference between the model output and the actual output. And we'll try to reduce this error. And once this error becomes minimum, we'll make prediction on the test data and we'll calculate the final accuracy. So guys, let me quickly open my PyCharm and I'll show you how the output looks like. So this is my PyCharm guys. Over here, I've already written the code in order to execute the use case. I'll go ahead and run this and I'll show you the output. So over here as you can see with every iteration the accuracy is increasing. So let me just stop it right here. So what I'll do I'll open my slides once more and we'll discuss the fundamentals of neural networks that are required in order to implement this use case. So we'll look at the agenda what are the things we need to discuss. So this is the agenda here guys. Uh, we'll start by first understanding why we need neural networks. Then we'll focus on what is the motivation behind neural networks and what exactly are neural networks. After that we'll understand what is single layer perceptron and multi layer perceptron. And then I'll tell you how to implement the use case that I was talking about in the beginning. And finally we'll discuss various applications of neural networks. So we'll move forward and we'll understand why we need neural networks. So in order to understand why we need neural networks we are going to compare the approach before and after neural networks. And we'll see what were the various problems that were there before neural networks. So earlier conventional computers use an algorithmic approach that is the computer follows a set of instructions in order to solve a problem. And unless the specific steps that the computer needs to follow are known, the computer cannot solve the problem. So obviously we need a person who actually knows how to solve that problem and he or she can provide the instructions to the computer as to how to solve that particular problem, right? So we first should know the answer to that problem or we should know how to overcome that challenge or problem which is there in front of us. Then only we can provide instructions to the computer. So this restricts the problem solving capability of conventional computers to problems that we already understand and know how to solve. But what about those problems whose answer we have no clue of? So that's where our traditional approach was a failure. So that's why neural networks were introduced. Now let us see what was the scenario after neural networks. So neural networks basically process information in a similar way the human brain does. And these networks, they actually learn from examples. You cannot program them to perform a specific task. They will learn from their examples, from their experience. So you don't need to provide all the instructions to perform a specific task. And your network will learn on its own with its own experience. All right, so this is what basically neural network does. So even if you don't know how to solve a problem, you can train your network in such a way that with experience, it can actually learn how to solve the problem. So that was a major reason why neural networks came into existence. So we'll move forward and we'll understand what is the motivation behind neural networks. 
So these neural networks are basically inspired by neurons which are nothing but your brain cells. And the exact working of the human brain is still a mystery though. So as I've told you earlier as well that neural networks work like human brain and so the name. And similar to a newborn human baby as he or she learns from his or her experience, we want a network to do that as well. But we want it to do very quickly. So here's a diagram of a neuron. Basically a biological neuron receives input from other sources, combines them in some way, perform a generally non-linear operation on the result and then outputs the final result. So here if you notice these dendrites, these dendrites will receive signals from the other neurons. Then what will happen, it will transfer it to the cell body. The cell body will perform some function. It can be summation, can be multiplication. So after performing that summation on the set of inputs, via exon it is transferred to the next neuron. Now let's understand what exactly are artificial neural networks. It is basically a computing system that is designed to simulate the way the human brain analyzes and process the information. Artificial neural networks has self-learning capabilities that enable it to produce better results as more data becomes available. So if you train your network on more data, it will be more accurate. So these neural networks, they actually learn by example. And you can configure your neural network for specific applications. It can be pattern recognition or it can be data classification, anything like that, all right? So because of neural networks, we see a lot of new technology has evolved. From translating web pages to other languages, to having a virtual assistant to order groceries online, to conversing with chatbots. All of these things are possible because of neural networks. So in a nutshell, if I need to tell you, artificial neural network is nothing but a network of various artificial neurons. Alright, so let me show you the importance of neural network with two scenarios, before and after neural network. So over here we have a machine and we have trained this machine on four types of dogs as you can see where I'm highlighting with my cursor. And once the training is done, we provide a random image to this particular machine which has a dog. But this dog is not like the other dogs on which we have trained our system on. So without neural networks, our machine cannot identify that dog in the picture as you can see it over here. Basically our machine will be confused. It cannot figure out where the dog is. Now when I talk about neural networks, even if we have not trained our machine on this specific dog, but still it can identify certain features of the dogs that we have trained on and it can match those features with the dog that is there in this particular image and it can identify that dog. So this happens all because of neural networks. So this is just an example to show you how important are neural networks. Now I know you all must be thinking how neural networks work. So for that we'll move forward and understand how it actually works. So over here I'll begin by first explaining a single artificial neuron that is called as perceptron. So this is an example of a perceptron. Over here we have multiple inputs x1, x2, dash, dash, dash till xn. And we have corresponding weights as well. w1 for x1, w2 for x2, similarly wn for xn. Then what happens, we calculated the weighted sum of these inputs. And after doing that, we pass it through an activation function. This activation function is nothing but it provides a threshold value. So above that value, my neuron will fire, else it won't fire. So this is basically an artificial neuron. So when I talk about a neural network, it involves a lot of these artificial neurons with their own activation function and their processing element. Now we'll move forward and we'll actually understand various modes of this perceptron or single artificial neuron. So there are two modes in a perceptron, one is training, another is using mode. In training mode, the neuron can be trained to fire for particular input patterns, which means that we'll actually train our neuron to fire on certain set of inputs and to not fire on the other set of inputs. That's what basically training mode is. When I talk about using mode, it means that when a taught input pattern is detected at the input, its associated output becomes the current output. Which means that once the training is done and we provide an input on which the neuron has been trained on, so it will detect the input and will provide the associated output. So that's what basically using mode is. So first you need to train it, then only you can use your perceptron or your uh, network. So these were the two modes guys. Next up we'll understand what are the various activation functions available. So these are the three activation functions although there are many more but I've listed down three step function. So over here the moment your input is greater than this particular value your neuron will fire else it won't. Similarly for sigmoid and sine function as well. So these are three activation functions. There are many more that I've told you earlier as well. So yeah, these are the three majorly used uh, activation functions. Next up what we are going to do we are going to understand how a neuron learns from its experience. So I'll give you a very good analogy in order to understand that. 
and later on when we talk about uh, neural networks or you can say multiple neurons in a network I'll explain you the math behind it I'll explain you the math behind learning how it actually happens so right now I'll explain you with an analogy and guys trust me that analogy is pretty interesting so I know all of you must have guessed it so these are two beer mugs and all of you who love beer can actually relate to this analogy a lot and I know most of you actually love beer so that's why I've chosen this particular analogy so that all of you can relate to it all right jokes apart so fine guys so there's a beer festival happening near your house and you want to badly go there but your decision actually depends on three factors first is how is the weather whether it is good or bad second is your wife or husband is going with you or not and the third one is any public transport is available so on these three factors your decision will depend whether you will go or not so we'll consider these three factors as inputs to our perception and we'll consider our decision of going or not going to the beer festival as our output so let us move forward with that and we'll see what are the various inputs that I'm talking about so the first input is how is the weather we'll consider it as x1 so when weather is good it will be 1 and when it is bad it will be 0 similarly your wife is going with you or not so that will be your x2 if she is going then it's 1 if she's not going then it's 0 similarly for public transport if it is available then it is 1 else it is 0 so these are the three inputs that I'm talking about let's see the output so output will be 1 when you're going to the beer festival and output will be 0 when you want to relax at home you want to have beer at home only you don't want to go outside so these are the two outputs whether you're going or you're not going now what a human brain does over here okay fine I need to go to the beer festival but there are three things that I need to consider but will I give importance to all these factors equally definitely not there will be certain factors which will be of higher priority for me I'll focus on those factors more whereas few factors won't affect that much to me all right so let's prioritize our inputs or factors so here our most important factor is weather so if weather is good I love beer so much that I don't care even if my wife is going with me or not or if there is a public transport available so I love beer that much that if weather is good that definitely I'm going there that means when x1 is high output will be definitely high so how we do that how we actually prioritize our factors or how we actually give importance more to a particular input and less to another input in a perception or in a neuron so we do that by using weights so we assign high weights to the more important factors or more important inputs and we assign low weights to those particular inputs which are not that important for us so let's assign weights guys so weight w1 is associated with input x1 w2 with x2 and similarly w3 with x3 now as I've told you earlier as well that weather is a very important factor so I'll assign a pretty high weight to weather and I'll keep it as 6 similarly w2 and w3 are not that important so I'll keep it as 2 2 after that I've defined a threshold value as 5 which means that when the weighted sum of my input is greater than 5 then only my neuron will fire or you can say then only I'll be going to the beer festival all right so I'll use my pen and we'll see what happens when weather is good so when weather is good our x1 is 1 our weight is 6 we'll multiply it with 6 then if my wife decides that she is going to stay at home and she will probably be busy with cooking and she doesn't want to drink beer with me so she's not coming so that input becomes 0 0 into 2 will actually make no difference because it will be 0 only then again there is no public transport available also then also this will be 0 into 2 so what output I get here I get here as 6 and notice the threshold value it is 5 so definitely 6 is greater than 5 that means my output will be 1 or you can say my neuron will fire or I'll actually go to the beer festival so even if these two inputs are zero for me that means my wife is not willing to go with me and there is no public transport available but weather is good which has very high weight value and it actually matters a lot to me so if that is high it doesn't really matter whether the two inputs are high or not I will definitely go to the beer festival all right now I'll explain you a different scenario so over here our threshold was five but what if I change this threshold to three so in that scenario even if my weather is not good uh, I'll give it a zero so zero into six but my wife and public transport both are available <laughs> all right so one into two plus one into two which is equal to four and it is definitely greater than three then also my output will be one that means I will definitely go to the beer festival even if weather is bad 
and my neuron will fire. So these are the two scenarios that I have discussed with you. All right. So there can be many other ways in which you can actually assign weight to your uh, problem or to your uh, learning algorithm. So these are the two ways in which you can assign weights and prioritize your inputs or factors on which your output will depend. So obviously or in real life all the inputs or all the factors are not as important for you. So you actually prioritize them and how you do that in perceptron you provide high weight to it. This is just an analogy so that you can relate to a perceptron to a real life. We'll actually discuss the math behind it later in the session as to how a network or a neuron learns. All right. So how the weights are actually updated and how the output is changing that all those things will be discussing later in the session. But my aim is to make you understand that you can actually relate to a real life problem with that of a perceptron. All right. And in real life problems are not that easy. They are very, very complex problems that we actually face. So in order to solve those problems, a single neuron is definitely not enough. So we need networks of neuron and that's where artificial neural network or you can say multi-layer perceptron comes into the picture. Now let us discuss that multi-layer perceptron or artificial neural network. So this is how an artificial neural network actually looks like. So over here we have multiple neurons in present in different layers. The first layer is always your input layer. This is where you actually feed in all of your inputs. Then we have the first hidden layer. Then we have second hidden layer and then we have the output layer. Although the number of hidden layers depend on your application on what are you working? What is your problem? So that actually determines how many hidden layers you'll have. So let me explain you what is actually happening here. So you provide in some input to the first layer, which is nothing but your input layer. You provide inputs to these neurons, all right? And after some function, the output of these neurons will become the input to the next layer, which is nothing but your hidden layer one. Then these hidden layers also have various neurons. These neurons will have different activation functions. So they'll perform their own function on the inputs that it receives from the previous layer. And then the output of this layer will be the input to the next hidden layer, which is hidden layer two. Similarly, the output of this hidden layer will be the input to the output layer. And finally, we get the output. So this is how basically an artificial neural network looks like. Now let me explain you this with an example. So over here, I'll take an example of image recognition using neural networks. So over here, what happens, we feed in a lot of images to our input layer. Now this input layer will actually detect the patterns of local contrast and then will feed that to the next layer, which is hidden layer one. So in this hidden layer one, the face features will be recognized. We'll recognize eyes, nose, ears, things like that. And then that will be again fed as input to the next hidden layer. And in this hidden layer, we'll assemble those features and we'll try to make a face. And then we'll get the output that is the face will be recognized properly. So if you notice here with every layer, we are trying to get a more abstract version or the generalized version of the input. So this is how basically an artificial neural network, how it works. All right. And there's a lot of training and learning which is involved that I'll show you now. Training a neural network. So how we actually train our neural network. So basically the most common algorithm for training a network is called backpropagation. So what happens in backpropagation after the weighted sum of inputs and passing through an activation function and getting the output. We compare that output to the actual output that we already know. We figure out how much is the difference. We calculate the error and based on that error, what we do, we propagate backwards and we'll see what happens when we change the weight. Will the error decrease or will it increase? And if it increases, when it increases by increasing the value of the variables or by decreasing the value of variables. So we kind of calculate all those things and we update our variables in such a way that our error becomes minimum. And it takes a lot of iterations. Trust me guys. It takes a lot of iterations. We get output a lot of times and then we compare it with the model with the actual output. Then again, we propagate backwards. We change the variables Then again, we calculate the output. We compare it again with the desired output of the actual output. Then again, we propagate backwards. So this process keeps on repeating until we get the minimum value. All right. So uh, there's an example that is there in front of your screen. Don't be scared of the terms that I use. I'll actually explain you with an example. So this is the example over here. We have 0, 1 and 2 as inputs and our desired output or the output that we already know is 0, 1 and 4. All right. So over here we can actually figure out that desired output is nothing but twice of your input. But I'm training a computer to do that, right? The computer is not a human. So what happens? I actually initialize my weight. I keep the value as 3. So the model output will be 3 into 0 is 0. 3 into 1 is 3. 3 into 2 is 6. Now obviously it is not equal to your desired output. So we check the error. Now the error that we have got here is 0, 1 and 2, which is nothing but your difference. 
So 0 minus 0 is 0, 3 minus 2 is 1, 6 minus 4 is 2. Now this is called an absolute error. After squaring this error, we get square error which is nothing but 0, 1 and 4. All right. So now what we need to do, we need to update the variables. We have seen that the output that we got is actually different from the desired output. So we need to update the value of the weight. So instead of 3, our computer makes it as 4. After making the value as 4, we get the model output as 0, 4 and 8. And then we saw that the error has actually increased. Instead of decreasing, the error has increased. So after updating the variable, the error has increased. So you can see that square error is now 0, 4 and 16. And earlier it was 0, 1 and 4. That means we cannot increase the weight value right now. But if we decrease that, make it as 2, we get the output which is actually equal to desired out. But is it always the case that we need to only decrease the weight? Definitely not. So in this particular scenario, whenever I'm increasing the weight, error is increasing. And when I'm decreasing the weight, error is decreasing. But as I've told you earlier as well, this is not the case every time. Sometimes you need to increase the weight as well. So how we determine that? All right, fine guys, this is how basically a computer decides whether it has to increase the weight or decrease the weight. So what happens here, this is a graph of square error versus weight. So over here, what happens, suppose your square error is somewhere here. And your computer, it starts increasing the weight in order to reduce the square error. And it notices that whenever it increases the weight, square error is actually decreasing. So it'll keep on increasing until the square error reaches a minimum value. And after that, when it tries to still increase the weight, the square error will increase. So at that time, our network will recognize that whenever it is increasing the weight after this point, error is increasing. So therefore, it will stop right there and that will be our weight value. Similarly, there can be one more scenario. Suppose if we increase the weight, but then also the square error is increasing. So at that time, we cannot increase the weight. At that time, computer will realize, okay, fine, whenever I'm increasing the weight, the square error is increasing. So it will go in the opposite direction. So it will start decreasing the weight and it will keep on doing that until the square error becomes minimum. And the moment it decreases more, the square error again increases. So our network will know that whenever it decreases the weight value, the square error is increasing. So that point will be our final weight value. So guys, this is what basically back propagation in a nutshell is. Fine, so we'll move forward and now is the correct time to understand how to implement the use case that I was talking about at the beginning. That is how to determine whether a node is fake or real. So for that, I'll open my PyCharm. This is my PyCharm again, guys. Uh, let me just close this. All right. So this is the code that I've written in order to implement the use case. So over here, what we do, we import the first important libraries which are required. Matplotlib is used for visualization. TensorFlow, we know, in order to implement the neural networks. NumPy for arrays, Pandas for reading the data set. Similarly, sklearn for label encoding as well as for shuffling and also to split the data set into training and testing paths. All right, fine, guys. So we'll begin by first reading the data set as I've told you earlier as well when I was explaining the steps. So what I'll do, I'll use pandas in order to read the CSV file which has the data set. After that, I'll define features and labels. So X will be my feature and Y will contain my label. So basically X includes all the columns apart from the last column which is the fifth one. And because the indexing starts from zero, that's why we have written zero till fourth. So it won't include the fourth column, all right? And so our last column will actually be our label. Then what we need to do, we need to encode the dependent variable. So the dependent variable, as I've told you earlier as well, is nothing but your label. So I've discussed encoding in TensorFlow tutorial. You can go through it and you can actually get to know why and how we do that. Then what we have done, we have read the data set. Then what we need to do is to split our data set into training and testing. And these are all optional steps. You can print the shape of your training and test data. If you don't want to do it, it's still fine. Then we have defined learning rate. So learning rate is actually the steps in which the weights will be updated. All right. So that is what basically learning rate is. Then when we talk about epochs means iterations. Then we have defined cost history. That will be an empty NumPy array and its shape will be one and it will include the flow type objects. Then we have defined NDIM, which is nothing but your X shape of axis one, which means your column. Then we'll print that. After that, we have defined the number of classes. So there can be only two classes, whether the node can be fake or it can be real. And this model path I've given in order to save my model. So I've just given a path where I need to save it. So I'll just save it here only in the current working directory. Now is the time to actually define our neural network. So we'll first make sure that we have defined the important parameters like hidden layers, number of neurons in hidden layers. So I'll take 10 neurons in every hidden layer and I'm taking four layers like that. Then X will be my placeholder and the shape of this particular placeholder is none comma N underscore dim. 
n underscore dim value I'll get it from here and none can be added, any value. I'll define one variable w and I'll initialize it with zeros and this will be the shape of my weight. Similarly for bias as well this will be the particular shape and there will be one more placeholder y dash which will actually be used in order to provide us with the actual output of the model. There will be one model output and there will be one actual output which we use in order to calculate the difference right. So we will feed in the actual values of the labels in this particular uh, placeholder y dash. And now we will define the model. So over here we have um, named the function as multi-layer perceptron and in it we will first uh, define the first layer. So the first hidden layer and we are going to name it as layer underscore one which will be nothing but the a matrix multiplication of x and weights of h1 that is the hidden layer one and that will be added to your biases b1. After that we will pass it through a sigmoid activation function. Similarly in layer two as well matrix multiplication of layer one and weights of h2. So if you can notice layer one was the network layer just before the layer two right. So the output of this layer one will become input to the layer two. And that's why we have written layer underscore one. It will be multiplied by weight h2 and then we'll add it with the bias. Similarly for this particular hidden layer as well and uh, this particular layer as well. But over here we are going to use the ReLU activation function instead of sigmoid. Then we are going to define the weights and biases. So this is how we basically define weights. This is how we basically define weights. So weights h1 will be a variable which will be a truncated normal with the shape of n underscore dim and n underscore hidden underscore one. So these are nothing but your shapes. All right and uh, after that what we have done we have defined biases as well then we need to initialize all the variables since in tensorflow we need to initialize the variables before we use it so that's how we do it we first initialize it and then we need to run it that's when your variables will be initialized after that we are going to create a saver object and then finally I'm going to call my model and then comes the part where the training happens cost function Cost function is nothing but you can say an error that will be calculated between the actual output and the model output. All right, so y is nothing but our model output and y dash is nothing but actual output or the output that we already know. All right, and then we are going to use a gradient descent optimizer to reduce error. Then we are going to create a session object as well. And uh, finally, what we are going to do, we are going to run the session. So this is how we basically do that. For every epoch, we will be calculating the change in the error as well as the accuracy that comes after every epoch on the training data. After we have calculated the accuracy on the training data, we are going to plot it for every epoch how the accuracy is. And after plotting that, we are going to print the final accuracy which will be on our test data. So using the same model, we'll make prediction on the test data. And after that, we are going to print the final accuracy and the mean squared error. So let's go ahead and execute this, guys. All right, so training is done. And this is the graph we have got for accuracy versus epoch. This is accuracy, y-axis represents accuracy, whereas this is epochs. We have taken 100 epochs and our accuracy has reached somewhere around 99%. So with every epoch, it is actually increasing apart from a couple of instances, it is actually keep on increasing. So the more data you train your model on, it will be more accurate. Let me just close it. So now the model has also been saved where I wanted it to be. This is my final test accuracy and this is the mean squared error. All right, so these are the files that will appear once you save your model. These are the four files that I've highlighted. Now what we need to do is restore this particular model. And I've explained this in detail how to restore a model that you have already saved. So over here what I'll do, I'll take some random range. I've taken it actually from 754 to 768. So all the values in the row of 754 and 768 will be fed to our model and our model will make prediction on that. So let us go ahead and run this. So when I'm restoring my model, it seems that my model is 100% accurate for the values that I've fed in. So whatever values that I have actually given as input to my model, it has correctly identified its class, whether it's a fake node or a real node. Because zero stands for fake node and one stands for real node, okay? So original class is nothing but which is there in my data set. So it is zero already. And what prediction my model has made is zero. That means it is fake. So accuracy becomes 100%. Similarly for other values as well. Fine guys, so this is how we basically implement the use case that we saw in the beginning. So in the slide you can notice that I've listed down only two applications although there are many more. So neural networks in medicine. Artificial neural networks are currently a very hot research area in medicine and it is believed that they will receive extensive application to biomedical systems in the next few years. And currently the research is mostly on modeling parts of human body. 
and uh, recognizing diseases from various scans. For example, it can be cardiograms, CAT scans, ultrasonic scans, etc. And uh, currently the research is going uh, mostly on uh, two major areas. First is modeling and diagnosing the cardiovascular system. So neural networks are used experimentally to model the human cardiovascular system. Diagnosis can be achieved by building a model of the cardiovascular system of an individual and comparing it with the real-time physiological measurements taken from the patient. And trust me guys, if this routine is carried out regularly, potential harmful medical conditions can be detected at an early stage and thus make the process of combating disease much easier. Apart from that, it is currently being used in electronic noses as well. Electronic noses have several potential applications in telemedicine. Now let me just give you an introduction to telemedicine. Telemedicine is a practice of medicine over long distance via a communication link. So what the electronic noses will do, they would identify odors in the remote surgical environment. These identified odors would then be electronically transmitted to another site where an door generation system would recreate them. Because the sense of the smell can be an important sense to the surgeon, telesmell would enhance telepresent surgery. So these are the two ways in which you can use it in medicine. You can use it in business as well, guys. So business is basically a diverted field with several general areas of specialization such as accounting or financial analysis. Almost any neural network application would fit into one business area or financial analysis. Now there is some potential for using neural networks for business purposes including resource allocation and scheduling. I have listed down two major areas where it can be used. One is marketing. So there is a marketing application which has been integrated with a neural network system. The airline marketing tactician is a computer system made of various intelligent technologies including expert systems. A feed forward neural network is integrated with the AMT which is nothing but airline marketing tactician and was trained using back propagation to assist the marketing control of airline seat allocation. So it has wide applications in marketing as well. Now the second area is credit evaluation. Now I'll give you an example here. The HNC company has developed several neural network applications and one of them is the credit scoring system which increases the profitability of existing model up to 27%. So these are few applications that I'm telling you guys. Neural network is actually the future. People are talking about neural networks everywhere. And especially after the introduction of GPUs and the amount of data that we have now, Neural network is actually spreading like plague right now. So guys, uh, this is it for today's session. So I'll just give you a quick summary of what all things we have discussed. So we first understood why we need neural networks. We compared the two scenarios, what was happening before neural network and how neural network actually changed it. Then we understood what exactly is neural network. And then we focused on a single artificial neuron that is called perception. And after focusing on perception, we came to know that complex problems cannot be solved by single artificial neuron. So at that time we need network of these artificial neurons and that's when multi-layer perception was introduced. Then we understood how to train a multi-layer perception with the help of backpropagation. And finally I explained to you how to implement the use case where we were predicting whether the banknotes are real or fake. So this is it for today's session guys. Thank you and have a great day.